Hi, I'm Beth. And I'm Marty, and we are coming to you live from the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. And we are really excited today. Our friends here on stage and in the audience, we will be talking to an astronaut who is currently orbiting the Earth on the International Space Station. These three guys are 3D printing gurus. Um, and they have actually designed things that are going to be printed in space. I'm Ansel. I've designed the Trillium tool. I'm Austin. I designed the carabiner tool clip. I'm Jason, and I designed two pliers and one handle. Now, these uh, three gentlemen will be back with us to show us their designs later in the show. Today's show is all about 3D printing and the future of space exploration. This, this is, is STEM, STEM in 30. 30. I don't know if you guys can tell, but we are a little bit excited about getting a chance to talk to an astronaut who right now is up in space. We will be talking to Serena Anyan Chancellor, and what I'm really excited about is that this is her first flight and her first downlink. Today's show is all about the future of space exploration and 3D printing. Now, you just met the winners of the Two for the Crew Challenge. We'll be bringing them back up here in a little bit. And we'll also be hearing today from NASA and from our guests, future engineers, and they'll be talking about 3D printing in space. We're also joined by Jason Cruzan from NASA, and he's going to be helping us answer that question, what's next? Now, we have a great live studio audience with us today. We want to uh, welcome Girls, Inc. <laughs> and higher achievement. We also have a whole bunch of folks in the IMAX theater tuning in and watching with us today as well. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with STEM in 30, STEM in 30 is a 30-minute program broadcast here from the National Air and Space Museum. And we cover everything from the Wright brothers all the way up to the International Space Station. Now, today is our last show of the year, and we're a little bit sad about that. However, we are really excited to give you guys a sneak peek at our next season and we have some amazing topics. We're going to be talking about hurricanes and roller coasters and Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. And robots. Don't forget the and robots. robots. Check out next season of STEM in 30. Here's what's coming up on STEM in 30. First there was man, then there was machine. We'll see what our first robotics teams are up to as their robots prepare to lift off. It's time to pull the ripcord and dive through the layers of the atmosphere to revisit the world record skydive. Stand by to reboot the suit. We'll see how our conservators protect the world's most famous spacesuit. Have you ever wanted to talk to an astronaut in space? Get your questions ready as we link up with the International Space Station. Whether it's a good idea or not, we're flying into a storm. We'll explore the atmospheric conditions that rock us like a hurricane. Commercial spaceflight is no longer science fiction. It's science fact. Join us as we learn from the pioneers of private spaceflight. Do you like roller coasters? It turns out they have a lot in common with rockets. Come with us to Six Flags America to explore rockets and roller coasters. Last stop, the moon. We're checking back in on our Apollo 11 command module as it continues its nationwide tour. All this and more this season on STEM in 30. We are joined by Jason Cruzan, NASA's Director for Advanced Exploration Systems Division. Jason, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Jason, can you tell us a little bit about Gateway and the humans return to the moon? Yeah, well, you guys started off the program talking about that you cover everything from the Wright brothers to the International Space Station. Well, there's a new topic for you guys, okay. and that is what we're building next, which is we're building our first human outpost around the moon. So think of a small outpost where people and crews will actually go and work and do science in orbit around the moon for the very first time. We've been to the moon. Why do we want to go back? 
Yeah, so when we went to the moon the first time, we went there, we landed, we actually were in a space race and a global race for that. This time it's actually about advancing science, exploration, learning to live off the land, growing space economy, new businesses in space, learning to utilize the resources of the moon in order to enable us to go to places like Mars. Well, if we go back to the moon, does that mean there isn't an interest in Mars or? No, actually, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's actually more essential. So what we're looking at doing is landing on the moon, having an orbital outpost around the moon. We're going to use the, the resources on the moon. By the way, the textbooks have been rewritten in the past 10 years. There's tons of water on the surface of the moon. Water is a key element to make rock, rocket fuel. We're going to get that rocket fuel from the surface of the moon to enable us to go to Mars. And NASA's doing a lot of different exploration. What are you most excited about? Most excited about is actually for to actually go build these new systems, to, to actually create that future that we're all going to live in. We've been living off the planet for a long time. Now it's time to leave Earth, break the chains of Earth, and actually go out into the solar system and for the first time build real spaceships. That. And, and, and the guys out here in the audience, they're who you're looking at for that. These folks in the audience will be the ones building the spaceships. We talked about the advanced manufacturing, 3D printing technology. All those are essential for us to be able to live off the land and live away from the planet. Awesome. Well, let's take a look at how NASA is exploring. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Now we are joined by Nikki uh, Weyerheiser, the manager for NASA's In Space Manufacturing. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Jason mentioned that 3D printing is going to be important for the moon and to Mars, but why do astronauts need a 3D printer? Ooh, I like this question. So as you may know, we don't have hardware stores in space. And, and for me, I don't know about y'all, but it never fails that if I go to the beach with my family, I forget my flip flops or my sunglasses, I have to run down the store and grab them. So up until now on space station, we're pretty close to Earth, right? So they launch a few spares and, and maintenance items, and then we just keep everything else on the ground and send them up as we need them. But when we go to the moon or Mars, that's not really going to be feasible. So being able to make whatever you need, wherever you are, uh, is really important. Cool. What kind of 3D printers are being developed right now for NASA? So I work a project called In Space Manufacturing, and we consciously made the decision to work with companies, uh, industry and academia, to build these state-of-the-art technologies for space. I'm sure that many of you have heard about 3D printing all in the news. It's a very rapidly evolving area mm -hmm. with the materials and the technologies. Um, so we work with companies. The first printer we launched was a company called Made in Space, Inc., a small business in California, and they built the first ever 3D printer for space. 
the real plan there was to test out how it works in microgravity. Does it work the same way it does on Earth? We weren't sure. We tested that and it did, good news. Um, they now have a commercial printer on Space Station called the Additive Manufacturing Facility and universities, international partners, companies can also print in space as well as NASA. Uh, we'll be launching the first ever integrated 3D printer and recycler in November uh, with a company called Tethers Unlimited Inc., another small business. Um, it's the first of its kind that I'm aware of that you can actually put a part in, recycle it back into feedstock, and print a whole new part. That's cool. Now, what kind of things do you see astronauts printing while they're in space? Oh, okay. Well, if you ask me, it's more a question of what are they not going to print when in space. Um, but really, a lot of things that you think of, obviously, it's uh, small hand tools, science experiments, um, exercise equipment, um, even small satellite components, possibly. Uh, we're going to be printing with metals, electronics, plastics, and even Martian and lunar regolith, which is Mars moon dirt, right? So even large scale structures like uh, habitats and so land. you're talking about going to Mars and using the dirt to print a house. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> we are absolutely going to do it. We've been working with the Corps of uh, Engineers to do just that. Um, and so a lot of progress there as well. Um, what's most important to us, though, is to be able to have folks that know how to design the parts we need. Um, it's a real art to it. It's a lot of fun. I don't know who likes Legos out there or Minecraft. Uh, it's kind of like that. It's pretty cool. Oh, I see a lot of hands. Um, so, yeah, but you have to know how to design the part and optimize it for that material and that printer. So we need designers. And to make that happen, uh, we started a program with ASME uh, with, with students uh, to design 3D print parts for space called Future Engineers. I'm too old to go to the moon or Mars. It's not going to be me if I'm really honest about it. It's going to be one of you out here, I'm pretty sure. Um, got any volunteers? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, so we want to make sure we have our designers, and then we can even design parts on the ground and email them to space. Wow. wow, that is incredible. Well, let's take a little bit more of a closer look at future engineers. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Got lift off of the Falcon 9. Experiment here on Earth. First, you pull back the drug with one lever, then you pull back the spring with the other lever. So, so these are these are the sliding locks that are on this. So you can see here was the, um, the little divots that I was talking about. We need people like you in the future. I love this as a doctor. I was really impressed that a kid that's not even real familiar or involved with this came up with that. As you head out into this world with all these amazing machines that I never even dreamed of, it's going to be the four of you that just gave these briefs that are going to be creating the new engineering technology, the new science discoveries that are going to reshape our entire world. So don't forget that. The future is in your hands and uh, just keep thinking big. It's awesome. We are joined by the founder of Future Engineers, Deanne Bell. Deanne, thanks for coming in today. Thanks so much for having me. Deanne, can you tell us a little bit about the Future Engineers challenges you guys have created? Yes, I'd love to. So Future Engineers is an online education program, and we issue national innovation challenges for kindergarten through 12th grade students all across the country. We've done six challenges so far, all of which have been presented by the ASME Foundation with technical assistance from NASA, and they each have a different theme, and they each engage students with solving real-world problems that NASA's working on right now. And many of the winners of our challenges have had the opportunity to go out into industry and to meet engineers, scientists, and those that are working on the future of space exploration. So what did the students actually create for one of these challenges? Great question. So, so far, all of the challenges that we have done are focused on 3D design and 3D printing. Now, we know not everyone has made a 3D design before, so if you go to the site, we have all kinds of education resources. We have science lessons, brainstorming tips, and design tools. So, if you want to make something on a 3D printer, you need to send it a file, right? So you need to sculpt that in the computer. And you can use software. We've got beginner software like Tinkercad. We've got more advanced software. And you basically take your idea and you make it a reality in software. And then it can be emailed up to space, which is pretty awesome. But this is just the beginning. We actually have grant funding from the US Department of Education. And Future Engineers is going to start launching innovation challenges of all kinds um, in the fall. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the, uh, the winners of today's design challenge, the two for the crew? 
Yes, so two for the crew. This is a two in one challenge. So the two for the crew challenge was to design a multifunctional object. So how can you take two things on the International Space Station, put them into one 3D print? Because saving space and volume and mass is very important on the International Space Station. And I'm excited to say that we have the winners of those challenges here today, which you met earlier. And um, the winner of our team division, we have got two. For the first time in Future Engineers history, we have a tie. And both of them will have their designs 3D printed on the International Space Station by Made in Space base on their additive manufacturing facility. Should we take a look at two for the crew? Yes. Let's launch the two for the crew challenge video. Firing chain is armed. Sound suppression water system activated. T minus two. 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 Lift off. joined by the winners of the two for the crew challenge uh, and they have their designs up here. These guys are good. Now I recently learned a little bit about 3D printing um, and design and so I printed a really snazzy fancy wrench. You guys are light year. I see Jason over here laughing at my wrench which is okay because I'm just learning. These guys are amazing. They are way beyond me. Way beyond me. Uh, <laughs> Hansel, why don't you tell us about your design? Yeah, um, so I've created the Trillium tool. It's a bi-directional ratchet wrench. Um, and essentially, well, I mean, what, the, what that means essentially is that it's, it ratchets in two directions. And I took inspiration from the ratchet wrench that they've actually printed on the space station already, uh, which is unidirectional. And I challenged myself to create a version of that that I think I could, you know, that I thought I could improve upon. And actually, you had to redesign it a little bit, didn't you? Definitely. Um, so essentially, with this model, I had a few options uh, on the space station because there are a few limitations, uh, you know, uh, time constraints and all of that. Um, you know, assembly, and this is an assembly, this has seven parts. It would take quite a while, you know, for the astronauts to actually put it together. So it'd be much more convenient to actually print that as a, as a single model, you know, something that you don't have to assemble. And that's where I've, you know, created this print in place model of a bi-directional ratchet wrench. Um, you know, so there's no assembly required and it's just much more convenient. That's really neat, thank you. Um, and Austin, why don't you tell us what your design is? So this is the carabiner tool clip. Uh, it combines a uh, carabiner that astronauts can use to clip onto themselves or any part of the International Space Station, but it also holds uh, ratchet wrenches on the side that they can use as tools for their experiments or working on the International Space Station, as well as hex sockets on the side here. Now is this the, the first iteration of this design or did you have to go back and work on it a little bit? Uh, uh, no, this is about the uh, third or fourth iteration. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you come up with the idea? Uh, so I was looking around um, just in NASA, right? And they have a little issue on the uh, space station. It's called zero gravity, right? So things tend to float away sometimes. So I thought, well, how can we mitigate that problem? And said, well, if we, uh, if we make a um, tool clip that holds their tools and can clip to them, it solves both of them. Awesome. All right, Jason, let's hear about yours. You've got a, a pair of pliers uh, here. Yes. So. When I looked on the NASA website, I realized that uh, they have pictures of the pliers that they have on, Na on the International Space Station, and all the handles are practically identical. So I decided that if we only use one set of handles for multiple plier heads, we could save the weight of the extra handles. Uh, so the, you would be able to use different plier heads with the same handles. Nice. So where did that idea come from? Uh, so I was browsing their website, and then I found pictures of, uh, na of the tool sets on NASA's big training pool, which uh, I believe you have heard of. <laughs> so uh, since they use practically the same tools on the International Space Station, I worked off of those, and I figured out that the handles were the same, so I made this. Nice. Guys, these designs are absolutely amazing. You all have a bright future in engineering. This is incredibly cool. Thank you for sharing them with us today. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to get students excited about science and engineering. And the 
uh, STEM and 30 team has produced a series of videos that will show you a simple classroom experience that you can do with your students that relate to the science that is currently being done on the International Space Station. Let's check out ISS Science. Hello, I'm astronaut Randy Comrade Bresnik. I'm here with my friends Marty and Beth at the National Air and Space Museum. Comrade spent six months living and working on the International Space Station. Before his flight, we worked with him on connecting what you do in your classroom to what goes on on the International Space Station. And now that I'm back from space, I've got some of my fellow astronauts to continue to show you how everyday science, stuff that you do in your classroom, connects to what we do in space. So watch ISS Science. Now there's nothing I like more than creating a vacuum chamber with an astronaut. Yeah, what <laughs> so you have to, to learn to live in an environment where there is no gravity. If you've got a Bunsen burner in your classroom or something else that you can heat this with, it allows you to be able to see the roots as they grow, and then you just hang these in your classroom. It does look like a big ball of snot here. <laughs> but you can really see the strands. But you can strands. see all the strands of the DNA. Three, two, one, launch! Oh, that was awesome! I don't know if you guys can tell by watching that, but we absolutely love filming those with astronauts because a lot of them are just big old science geeks. Kate Rubin was so excited about doing that experiment. She pulled out, it's a big old glob of snot. <laughs> one, of the, one of the astronauts that we just filmed with was Joe Acaba. Um, he is a former teacher and uh, we uh, did a little math with him. Yes, we did. Uh, Joe was a math and science teacher and we did, uh, we had a chance to do a pan balance activity which relates to how algebra works. And as someone who was not a great algebra student, uh, I really could have used this when I was in middle school uh, to help me wrap my head around. And that was a lesson I used to, to use when I taught fifth grade that an equation balances. And as long as you know that and to really be able to see it in a visual way and have an astronaut walk you through that, we think is incredibly cool. So check out ISS Science. That video will be coming out pretty soon. The other thing we were able to do with Joe, we were very lucky uh, that Joe talked a little bit about some of the ordinary things that we take for granted here on Earth uh, that become extraordinary uh, when you are in space. And so by talking to, to Joe and, and the other astronauts, we've realized they're normal people. You know, Joe, when he was in space, he might have been able to put his pants on two legs at a time, but really, he's just an average Joe. Hi, my name is Joe Acaba. I'm a NASA astronaut, but anybody that knows me knows I'm just an average Joe. Can you call in sick? I'm not sure who you would call, but uh, luckily we go into quarantine a few weeks before launch and we get to the International Space Station not sick. And since we all do that, we don't get sick on ISS. That's pretty cool. Do you get days off? Uh, we try to. Uh, we work pretty hard Monday through Friday. Uh, they try to give us a half a day off on Saturday and usually Sundays we try to keep that as a free day, but having days off is pretty important. You got to rest the body and the mind. Uh, do you file taxes from space? If you're up there during that period of time, you do have to file taxes. I guess you could uh, ask for an extension. Luckily, I got back in February, so I made it in time to file my own taxes. Do you have roommates on the ISS? Yes, there's usually a crew of six on the ISS, but we have our own little crew quarters, so we do have a little bit of private space. You know, you can imagine six people living in a five bedroom house for six months, you get to know them pretty well. Was there any language barrier on the ISS? So we kind of resort to whatever language the other person knows better. So there's all kinds of languages going on. Sometimes there's a language barrier, a little miscommunication, but you just got to work through that. Do you have movie nights on the ISS? Yes, we try to have a movie night, usually on Saturday nights. It was kind of cool. We all get together. We got a big screen and a projector. The cool thing is you're up in space, you're floating around. So you put bungee cords on handrails and then you just kind of hang out and you float and you watch the movie. So the best movie theater off the planet. How do you do laundry? It's beautiful. On ISS, we don't do laundry. We throw our clothes away. It's awesome. What's your favorite thing to do in microgravity? Float. 
So did you lose anything while you were on ISS? We lose things all the time and it's kind of frustrating. And you can tell when you float into a module and you see an astronaut doing this, you know they lost something because you're just trying to see, does it catch the corner of your eye? Is it gonna bounce off of a wall? Uh, we had one crewmate, I'm not gonna tell you who it was, who actually lost like an iPad. He had it, then he didn't have it and we couldn't find it. Uh, we looked, we looked for weeks, we tried to find that iPad, and then one day I was just cleaning on a Saturday and there was the iPad just floating in the module. So I don't know where it went. So losing things, it's frustrating, but it happens because things float. Now Marty, uh Joe spent time on the International Space Station and probably used a lot of tools. I don't know about you, but the tools that, not your wrench in particular, but the tools that these students have designed, I could use them in my house. I mean, it would, the, the pliers alone would reduce the amount of stuff I have in the toolkit just by themselves. Well, and that's one of the, the really cool things about NASA is that a lot of the technologies that they develop are then put out into the private sector. And so, you know, things like how your tennis shoes are designed and smoke detectors and, and graphite, graphite shafted golf clubs all can be traced back to NASA. And what's really exciting for me is that we've got middle and high school students designing this stuff yeah. that's being printed in space and will eventually make it out, you know, into the private sector so we can all benefit from it. That's really cool. Well, I have a challenge for future engineers. I want a self hammering hammer that's small enough that I can fit in my pocket. A self hammering hammer? A hammering hammer. Just the, so just hold, I can just hold it and it just hammers into it. So you are not an engineer. No, I'm not. No. <laughs> no, but we will be talking to one shortly. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, we will be talking with NASA astronaut uh, Serena Anyan Chancellor as she orbits the Earth. Yes, yeah, Serena was selected to Na or joined NASA in 2006 as a flight surgeon, and in 2009, she was selected as a NASA astronaut. Not only is she an engineer, but she is also, uh, not only is she a doctor, but she's also an engineer. Yeah, she, is, she does both of those, which just kind of boggles my mind. This is her first space flight. She launched earlier this month, so she's not been in space very long. She is a member of Expedition 5657. Now, she did live here in D.C. for a while, uh, and we are very fortunate that we have some of her family members with us today. They're Always. joining us. They're excited to, to, <laughs> to join in and see her today. I understand that they've gotten a couple of phone calls from her. Yes, yes, they have, apparently. <laughs> I, and I bet you know a lot about Serena. Now, Something that you guys may not know about Serena is that she actually spent some time in Antarctica with some penguins and, you know, um, lived a couple of months on the ice in a tent. Yes, but there are more things about Serena. Are. Here are five things that you might not know about Serena Anyan Chan Chancellor. <laughs> Five things that you probably didn't know about me. Probably number one, our family has two dogs who, who really think they are brothers. And one is a 130 pound French Mastiff named Boss Hog. And the other is a 12 pound miniature Dachshund named Oscar. And they run around together and they think they are absolute brothers and absolutely the same, but they are absolutely the heart and soul of our family. Number two. Uh, our family absolutely loves to watch Aggie baseball. It's one of the favorite things that we do together as much as we can, certainly during baseball season in the spring. And in fact, it was the last thing we did uh, before coming out to Russia to prepare for a launch. We watched the Aggies play baseball at the University of Tennessee. Number three, uh, I actually do still practice medicine. I'm an active physician, and one of my favorite places to see patients is at a free clinic in Galveston, Texas, uh, where we practice medicine for uh, the underserved and those who can't afford medical care and do not have insurance, and that's at St. Vincent's House in Galveston, Texas. Completely student-run free clinic, but it's one of the joys. Um, I love going there, and I love seeing my patients, and it allows me to teach medical students and residents um, really how to practice medicine in an underserved environment 
and something I enjoy doing every week when I'm able. Number four, uh, my husband and I had a very non-traditional wedding on a thousand acre ranch and part of our wedding reception, we actually had a rodeo event and there was a big calf roping event that occurred. And most of our guests say they had never ever been to a wedding or a reception like that, but thought it was the best thing they'd ever been to. Final one, number five, something many people do not know about me is that when I was uh, getting my bachelor's degree at the George Washington University, I also needed to work to earn some money. And so I actually taught martial arts. I taught Kung Fu to school age kids from age five to about 15. And I would do that three times a week. And that's how I earned money in college, teaching martial arts. Now, yes. We will be joined by her shortly. Now here on STEM in 30, we have a little contest going. Yeah, so we've been really fortunate. We've had an opportunity to actually do a downlink with the International Space Station before. We talked to Randy Comrade Bresnik, and while Comrade was in space, um, I had had an opportunity to meet him and work with him. Um, I had also met Paolo Nespoli, who was up, and, um, and then we had kind of met Mark Vandahai. We, we saw him doing some neutral buoyancy lab training. We got a chance to shake his hand while he was in a spacesuit. So I had kind of met three of the astronauts that were on board the International Space Station. Now I have to point out here that Marty is the bigger space geek than I am. And I had the good fortune of working with Joe before Marty met him this, on his post-flight tour. So I knew all four astronauts while they were on the International Space Station for 53 and 54. And so now, um, one of our colleagues, uh, Paul, who is one of our amazing producers, he's met Serena before, and neither one of us have. And so for the last two or three days, he's let us know that. But I think, I think this counts as meeting her today, right? No, it doesn't. We've gone over this before. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> so we're getting ready to connect to the International Space Station, and you're going to see some stuff coming up that is, is pretty cool. Um, it's not easy. We get uh, a signal coming from NASA headquarters. That signal from NASA headquarters comes from Houston. It comes to Houston from the International Space Station. Satellites are linking up. It's really incredibly cool. Um, NASA makes it look really easy, but it is not. It's not. And, and now what we're doing is, what we're going to have to do is we'll have uh, some technical language at the beginning uh, to make sure that the, the space station can go through mission control and then get to us and then we go back through mission control and then it goes back up to the space station and that's how we're at actually able to talk to, <laughs> to astronauts while they are working in low earth orbit. So you will see a, a little bit of a delay, you know, a, a second or so, but when you think about what we're getting ready to do, Serena is on the space station that is traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, 250 miles above the Earth, and we're connecting with her with about a one second delay. That's pretty good. Oh, it's terrific. Uh, also, one of our curators, and I know that uh, Serena's sister has gotten phone calls uh, from the International Space Station, and that's a little different. It is. We, we, um, our curator reached out to us that she got a phone call from astronaut Chell Lindgren, and uh, she said, hey, can you guys come by and record this for us? We want to use this for a program coming up. So we're like, sure. And I was really excited about it. I thought, we're going to get to hear a phone call that came from space. It's going to sound, you know, NASA, do you hear? And it's going to be all cluttered, and it's going to be really cool. And then she played the voicemail. And it was crystal clear. I mean, crystal clear. It, it didn't sound like it was coming from space. It sounded like it was coming from next door. And the other thing that they get to do is uh, they will watch television up in space. Uh, they have email and can they do video conferencing? They can. They can do. So there are a lot of different ways that the astronauts stay in contact with their family while they are on the International Space Station. And with the last crew, we were lucky enough that uh, some of our material was actually sent up to the International Space Station. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we've learned doing some of these shows and talking to some people in Houston is that keeping the astronauts healthy is really important. And when we talk about health, we don't only mean their physical health. They work out for two hours a day. Um, I think if I were on the International Space Station, I would make sure that I could run for 90 minutes because then I could say I ran all the way around the Earth. 
I think that would be really cool. But not only do they keep them physically healthy, but they also keep them mentally healthy. And the phone calls are one of the ways to do that. Talking to Earth like we're getting ready to do is a way to do that. They also send up information for them. So if they want a newspaper, they'll send up the newspaper. They'll send up TV shows. Um, they'll send those things up for them to keep them healthy. And then one of the astronauts' favorite things are resupply missions. Okay. Oh, we're getting ready to hear from okay, Capcom. Okay, okay. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? STEM in 30, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is STEM in 30 and future engineers at this the National Air and Space future Museum. How do you hear me? And I have you loud and clear at the Air and Space Museum. Hello, future engineers. Very good to be with you today. Hi, Serena. This is Beth Wilson and Marty Kelsey, and we are really excited to be talking to you right now. We have the 3D printing winners here and a bunch of kids with uh, a lot of questions. And to begin, Marty's got a question. Serena, how has your first trip into space been so far? You know, it has been outstanding. The rocket ride up here was absolutely amazing. And it's, it's really fascinating to see how quickly your body gets used to moving in space and realizing you have so much more space to, to float in and fly in here than you do just by walking on the ground. Serena, we have Jason here. He is one of our challenge winners and he has a question. So uh, what are some of the possible uses of in-space manufacturing in the near future? Jason, that's a great question, and you know, after being up here for almost a month now, I realize how quickly that that's a very critical need. And the reason is, is you know, we're always doing maintenance on board the space station, making sure when things break, we're able to fix them. But every time we need parts or tools or anything that you know that we may need to help fix the station, we have to launch it from the ground. And so that's a lot of up mass, and that means we need rockets to do it. And so we're able to create some of those parts, whether it's a drill bit or anything like that. If we could make that up here in space, you know, by utilizing something like 3D printing, that would be so much better and easier for us. We've got Ansel, one of our two for the crew challenge winners. Ansel, what's your question? If you could have anything you wanted 3D printed on the ISS, what would it be? Hi, Ansel. I love this question because the first thing that came to mind was ice cream. I really miss ice cream up here. But if I had to pick something else, and I know we've been talking about parts maybe to help repair the space station, tools, things like that. One thing I thought about was what is something that all astronauts and people need if they're on a long duration space mission or let's say living on the moon? Medicines. Is there some way we could 3D print medicines on board the space station. Sure, it's not using plastic like what you're used to seeing with 3D printing, but could we use some of that other biological material and create medications for people to use? So that's the one thing that came straight to mind. And we have Austin, who is another uh, Two for the Crew Challenge winner. Austin, what's your question? Do the material properties of 3D printing material change when printed in zero gravity? So Austin, that's another terrific question. And actually, the, the, the materials themselves, the properties don't change. But the way they extrude from the machine, we think may change a little bit. So far on the space station, we've done more of a technology demonstration to say, does 3D printing even work up here? Are we getting what we expected? And the answer is yes. So when it comes out of the machine, like that, we are still getting the objects that we expected. But I think in the future, they're going to have to look at, hey, it may look the same as it does on Earth when we use a 3D printer, but is the internal structure of the object the same, or does microgravity affect that? Because we see so many bubbles and everything. Great question. If there is no up, down, left, or right, how do you know what direction you are going in? You know, there are many days that I start going into a module and I'm not sure where I'm going. And then I come out to eat breakfast. And there are people eating breakfast on the side or even upside down. And so I see all my crewmates and I think, where am I? And what direction is everything pointing? And the great thing is you can point in any direction. There is no up, there is no down. It's really neat because if there's a bunch of us in one module, we can all usually wiggle and fit and fly around each other and do what we need to do. Serena, our next question might be from a voice that you recognize. Hi, Serena, this is your niece, Anne Sophia, and I have a question for you. 
What kind of personal belongings did you bring into space and how did you decide what to bring? Hi, Anna Sophia, so good to see you. And I know a bunch of my family is there in DC and I'm so glad you're able to come as well as those listening from Houston and everywhere else. I love all of you guys. So Anna Sophia, I definitely brought a lot of pictures of my family that's very important to me and they're in my crew quarters. And our crew quarters is like our little bedroom here on the space station. It's about the size of a telephone booth. And you think, well, that's not very big, but it's big enough when you can use all the area. But the other thing I brought, which is really cool and comes in handy, is my personal back scratcher. And this is great because you never know when you might need it. And it's great to be able to scratch your back when you need to. Hi, my name is Katie, and what is your daily routine? So Katie, our daily routine, usually we are up by about 6 a.m., 6.30. Uh, we all gather together and eat breakfast together. And today for breakfast, I had cereal and eggs. And food is another very interesting topic up here. It's something that we have to prepare and we usually have to add water to so that we can eat it. And then starting at about 7.30, we, have, we call Mission Control in Houston and Huntsville and Moscow and all the Mission Controls around the world and talk about the plan for the day. But if you look at what we're doing during the day, it's all different. So for example, today, uh, we've got a SpaceX vehicle that is coming up here to station very shortly. So I was preparing cargo for that. And after I finish talking with you guys at the Smithsonian, I'm actually going to be setting up an experiment in the United States lab that's going to look at different cancer therapies. So I'm really excited about this because unfortunately cancer is something that almost all of us there, and I'm sure you guys there at the Smithsonian, you either a family member or a friend, um, and it's neat that we're able to do those sorts of experiments on board the ISS. I also exercise for two hours a day every day uh, to keep our bones and muscles strong and healthy. And then finally, by about 7.30 at night, we're all eating dinner together. Hi, my name is Sarah, and do you study things in space or do scientists on Earth study you in space? That's another great question, and uh, it's definitely a little bit of both. Um, certainly like the cancer therapy that I talked about, that's one thing I'm going to be studying up here. But scientists and engineers and everybody in the ground are constantly monitoring myself and the rest of my crew. Uh, they're looking at the different changes that happen in our bodies, with our muscles, with our heart, and with our eyes. They've even seen some changes in the eyeballs. And part of the reason they're doing this is because they think that some of the things they discover with us could help people on Earth. And the other goal that they're looking at is when we go to a place like Mars or, you know, another, maybe even the moon, where we go back to live for a long period of time, we want to know what's going to happen to the human body over that period of time. And so they're constantly studying us and we're even drawing blood on ourselves up here, just like you do in the doctor's office. And we're sending those results down to the ground. Hi, my name is Ramsey. And my question is, have you ever had the idea to get a lot of water, pour it out, and see what happens. Let me show you what happens with water. Hold on one second. So this is really neat. I had to learn how to eat up here when I first got up here. But you got to look at what happens to fluids. Nothing really pours up here. So I can open a special packet of soup, and that soup isn't going anywhere. It doesn't spill out. It sticks to the surface, and it sticks to each other. And that's because of something called surface tension. This is a drink bag, and it's filled with raspberry lemonade. And I'm going to show you what happens when I open this valve. It doesn't come pouring out. Just watch. That bubble will keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm going to make it kind of big. And then watch what happens when I stick my hand to it. See how it just sticks to my hand? It just waves there. It doesn't really go anywhere. It just sticks right to the surface. So I could drink my lemonade right from my hand. 
Oh, and look, I almost lost my drink bag. If you don't, if you turn your back, everything floats away. Oh, there goes water everywhere. Okay, hold on. Well, I've thoroughly made a mess up here, but luckily it's just raspberry lemonade that I'll have to wipe up later. But it shows you the importance of keeping everything restrained up here on board the station and what fluids really do. It's the same way when you put water on your toothbrush. It just sticks there in a big bubble until you put it in your mouth and start brushing your teeth. Hi, my name is Bridget. What, in your opinion, is the hardest thing to do in microgravity? Well, I got to be honest, because that's a great question. And some of the hardest things to do up here are things that you do every day on the ground pretty easily. And one of those is going to the bathroom. It's just not easy up here. We've got special pieces of equipment to help us out. But it takes a little practice, and you got to make sure you get good at it. And the other thing is, we don't have a shower up here. So we have special towels and soap. And for us, we kind of take a towel bath so that we keep ourselves clean. Um, but if, you know, if I, if I had my druthers, boy, I'd love to have a shower up here. Hi, I'm Seth. Uh, what is your favorite experiment that you've done in the ISS, and how will it benefit us on Earth? So I love it when I get questions like this because I want people, I want everybody certainly here at the Smithsonian today, all the future engineers and everywhere to understand why the science on the space station helps us out here on Earth. So one of the experiments I did the very first week with my crewmate Alex Gerst from Germany was something called myotones. And what that experiment did is it looked at Alex's muscles and some of the other tissues that connect to the muscles called tendons. And we basically are studying those muscles to see how he changes while he's up here during six months. And you may think, well, why is that important to me? Well, if you've ever been in a hospital for a long time, or maybe your grandma or grandpa, you know that when they come out of the hospital, sometimes they're really weak because they've been lying in a bed. And so we're trying to figure out how our muscles change because we think it's the same as it would be in grandma or grandpa in the hospital. And could we somehow keep them from not getting weak in the hospital? Could we develop new methods to keep them strong so that when they finally get over their illness, they can come home and they almost feel like they never left? So they like to look at us astronauts up here because for most of the day we're floating around. You know, we're not using our leg muscles. Maybe when I work out I do. But for most of the day, we're floating around. So it's very similar to lying in a hospital bed. And that's why I really liked doing that experiment just a couple of weeks ago. Hi, my name is Laurel. And my question is, if you could build another space, space station, what would you do to improve it? Ooh, so many things come to mind. This Really, the space station is an amazing laboratory up here. And I was so impressed when I first got here with everything that I saw. But if I got to pick, I'll say two things. I would definitely have a shower. I don't know how we do it, but something. Because just a warm, hot shower would feel so good. And the second thing is, and this may surprise people, but you think about all the trash cans you use in your house and on Earth on a daily basis. Very easy to throw things away, and it is for us up here too. The problem is, for a period of time, we have to live with our trash. We can't throw it on the curb and have the trash men come pick it up, so we are very careful about sealing and isolating things, but trash builds up really quickly when, you don't, when you're having to live with it, and we just don't see that on Earth because we give it to the trash men every day and let them take care of it. And so we need a good way for us to handle trash up here and get rid of it in a much, much easier way. Because right now we send it down on our visiting vehicles, on our cargo vehicles that come up. We actually pack those full with a lot of trash sometimes to get it off the space station. Hello, Serena. How do you do repairs on the space station? Wow, and we, we definitely do a lot of repairs. Space Station is, is getting up there in its years, and so to make sure she keeps running as smoothly as possible, I'd say some of our daily tasks are what we call maintenance. So we'll often do repairs inside the space station. Like, for example, if the toilet breaks and or anything like that, then we'll do repairs on that inside. But if a bigger piece of equipment breaks, 
then often we have to fix it on the outside of the space station. And if we do that, then we have to do a spacewalk. And we put on our two big spacesuits and head out the door. And we're talking with Mission Control in Houston the whole time to make sure that everything we're doing is correct. And it's a, a really important day when that happens on board the space station because everybody's involved and we want to make sure we keep everybody safe. And we had one just a couple of weeks ago. Drew and Ricky were in their spacesuits and Alex and I helped them get in. And then Alex and I helped move the robot arm to move Ricky around station to get certain things done. And it ended up going really well. Hi, my name is Devin, and what happens if you get sick in space? Ah, it's right up my alley. You know I'm a doctor. So, but certainly we have a lot of doctors on the ground that are looking out after us. Um, but on space, we actually have our own medical kits. We've got medications if we need them. If people get sick, we've got bandages we can use. Um, if someone gets a really deep cut and we need to put in sutures, all of us are trained to do that. Um, so we have a lot of capability up here um, to try and take care of each other if someone gets sick. What has your experience as an astronaut taught you? I think the biggest thing it has taught me is patience and perseverance. And what does that mean? That means sometimes when you're trying to do something, it's not gonna work out the first time. And it's not gonna work out the second time and it's not gonna work out the third, the fourth, the fifth, or the sixth time. And you wanna get really mad and really frustrated because you know, you're wasting your time and you're trying to get something done. And sometimes you just gotta learn to take a step back, take a deep breath, and look at the problem from a different angle. And that's what engineering is all about, right? Solving problems in different ways. And I have learned so much patience by a lot of the training I've done because sometimes the training is very hard. And at first you think, I can't do that. Stop, take a deep breath, try again. Try a different way. It usually works out. Where does your astronaut wa astronaut's waste go? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about trash or just any waste on board the space station, kind of like we talked about, we can't just shoot it out the airlock. Um, like you see in the movies, uh, we can't do that because that would clutter the whole environment, the space station and, and a lot of other things live in. So for a good portion of the time up here in the station, we keep our trash in separate little areas to kind of keep it away from our living areas. But and essentially, we do live with our trash in the house. Serena, thank you so much for talking with us today. We want to present you with a 3D printed challenge coin that was designed by a middle school student named Emily. When you get back to Earth, please come by the museum to collect it. Enjoy the rest of your time on the station. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was great to talk with you and all the future engineers. Have a great day, everybody. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. All right, that was absolutely amazing. Now, we want you guys to participate a little bit with us for a second. Everybody in the audience, if you are over 18 years old, raise your hand. Over 18. All right, quite a few. All right. Now, everyone who is under 18, raise your hand. Oh, that's a lot. Oh, that's a lot of people. That's definitely that's a lot. That's a whole lot of people. <laughs> okay, those of you with your hands raised, we're going to talk about you for a couple of minutes. All right, so here's something that's going to kind of blow your mind. If you are under 17 years old, since the day you were born, there has not been a single day, not a single one since you've been alive, when there has not been an astronaut in space aboard the International Space Station. Yeah, that's almost 18 years of always having a human on the International Space Station. And you all, those of you who are under 17, are the right age to be the next generation of explorers. So, so we're looking to you guys to be the ones that lead that charge, do the 3D printing designs, fill in all of those jobs, because it's not just the astronauts. It's definitely not just the astronauts. To get to space, we need innovators. And what does it mean to innovate? It means to use your creativity, come up with ideas of technologies that haven't been designed before, and then use those engineering skills to ask the right questions, find the right answers, and turn that idea into reality. And then one day you're gonna look up at the International Space Station and say, hey, that was my idea, and I'm getting an astronaut even farther into our solar system. And it's not just engineers. 
Uh, you could be a chemist. You could develop new fuels that take us faster and farther than we ever have been. Who out there likes to cook? Anybody like to cook? We need you too, because the astronauts, they have to eat. And so how cool would it be that you guys might design the menu for the next group of astronauts that get us to the moon and get us to Mars? Pretty much any job you can think of is going to be needed for us to go farther, to go places like the moon, like Jason was talking about, and use that as a gateway to go on to Mars. Now, if this isn't inspiring enough, and if talking to the International Space Station hasn't inspired you enough today, you can, NASA does have a camera on the outside of the International Space Station, and you can see the Earth underneath as it goes around. So let's check out the ISS HD Earth Viewing Experiment. Thank you all for being here today. That's all the time we have. We would like to thank Serena for joining us today. That was absolutely incredible. We also want to thank our sponsor, Boeing and NASA. And the Space, Fo uh, the Space Foundation, uh, Future Engineers, and the ASME Foundation. Thanks for watching. You guys wave.